Hello, everybody. I'm Levi Litvoy uh, from Central European University, and I am talking to uh, my friend and colleague, Robert Atcock. Thank you very much for joining us. He's uh, at uh, American University in Washington, D.C. So say hi. Hi, everyone. Yes, and we are here today to talk about uh, measurement validity, uh, shared standard for quali uh, qualitative and quantitative research. Uh, it's a paper. I'm taking you back a couple decades right now, so sorry about that. Uh, so, so t tell us about this paper. How did this come about? Where, where does this come from? Okay, so this comes from my uh, early years as a graduate student um, at, uh, at UC Berkeley. Um, and so freshman year of my graduate experience, I took a class on conceptualization um, and measurement um, with uh, David Collier, who's my co-author on this piece, um, and Henry Brady. And the two of them were running this whole idea about we'll get a qualitative and a quantitative scholar to teach together um, on issues of conceptualization um, and measurement. And so that course was producing a lot of discussions. Um, and so coming out of the course, I remember having a discussion uh, with David Collier um, about the fact that the concept of validity was a real mess. And we didn't really understand what was going on in the readings um, and so on. And he was like, well, we should do something about that then. Um, and ultimately I got some RA money uh, to spend some time digging through uh, the literature on validity um, in psychology and trying to figure out if there was some kind of intervention um, that we could make. Um, and so it comes out of both kind of classroom experience and research experience and a senior scholar kind of seeing some role for me to play um, in uh, the project that he was pursuing. <laughs> that, that's actually a very cool story. Let me let me give you my story about the, my connection to this to this paper. So I'm, I'm uh, I was this like uh, stereotypical very quant guy always, and uh, and uh, I was I was at a conference. I was uh, I wrote a paper on I don't even know what I I think it I think democracy was actually one of the variables in 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 uh, in in the model and notice i said variables because mm -hmm. because i presented very much in terms of uh here's the model this variable is correlated to that variable and this was one of my first conferences ever uh maybe not the first but but second or something and and one of the comments i got from the discussion is that i need to stop talking about variables because i need to start thinking in terms of concepts and uh, and this really stuck with me because it clicked immediately. I'm like, oh right, of course, this is this this makes sense. I, I have a structural equation modeling background, and this 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 immediately clicked and and made sense. Uh, and and then later I read this paper, and I was like, this paper is what I'm going to assign in every one of my classes. <laughs> this is perfect. So so uh, so yeah. So that, that's. that's 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 funny to hear because I would say like our biggest anxiety in writing the piece um, was that, I mean I was actually trained as a political theorist um, David Collier is a qualitative comparative historical um, analyst and so on and we wanted to set things up in a way that we could have a conversation um, with uh, scholars who think in terms of variables and structural equation models and so on but neither of us actually knew how to put a structural equation model together um, and so there was a lot of like uh, reaching out to uh, more statistically trained scholars to be like, are we doing this right? Um, <laughs> are we saying something wrong here? Um, and so on. And so the idea of shared standards, I think it's better formulated in terms of just the possibility for communication. Can we talk in ways that allow us to have a kind of mutually productive um, conversation? Can we learn to translate back and forth uh, between the language of variables and language of concepts um, and so on? And so we we're pretty confident about what we were doing on the qualitative methodology side of things, because David Collier was a leading figure um, in the area, but whether we would successfully get buy-in from a more quantitative audience um, or not was definitely the kind of major, uh, I think, say, anxiety point um, as we were working on it. No, that, I mean, f for me, it immediately clicked. And, 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 and I have to be honest, uh, the appeal of bringing together the qualitative and quantitative traditions is... Yeah, was appealing to me. KKV is what was appealing to me. I know, I know it gets a bad rap now, but we'll, we we can talk about that later. But I, 
I can, I, I've noticed as I was rereading it right before our conversation, I noticed that Cam Bolin was tanked in the, <laughs> in, in the list. I was like, oh, you got Cam to read this. That's great. Uh, yeah, I, that was, yeah. That, that was a key lesson I learned from, so I wrote two papers with David Collier um, in my mm -hmm. in years um, of graduate school and everything was always sent out to a ton of people for feedback during the writing process. And because he was a senior scholar, they would respond um, and so on. And so the idea that, that kind of in writing something, when you're writing about someone, perhaps you want to find out if they agree with what you're saying um, or not. Um, and so it meant that things took a long time to finish because of a long process of trying to get feedback from a bunch of different people. Um, but it also uh, was pretty key, I think, to the way we wanted to write, because if you're trying to talk to a bunch of different people and have them all kind of think what you're doing is uh, pretty decent, uh, then that leads you to try to f articulate this um, language or framework through which you can talk uh, to people uh, working in different methodological traditions. So I think that's ultimately actually my favorite contribution uh, from the piece is really that kind of <laughs> shared language and ability to have a conversation uh, kind of goal rather than any of the more technical like this particular type of validation uh, type um, of contributions. All right, so one more quick story before I uh, before we launch into actual content. I was talking to Dvora Yanov. This was still in Ljubljana. At the, uh, I was just an instructor at the CPR method school. I wasn't running it, and she is and uh, like arch interpretivist uh, scholar. Um, and it was really funny because you know um, me, the extra quant person, and the arch interpretivist, we don't mix normally very well. I like Dvora on a personal level, but one day we were walking outside in the wonderful summer park and and she asked me so what are you teaching today <laughs> and and uh, i i basically gave a summary of your article i didn't i didn't because uh, it was an advanced quant advanced regression class there in one of the classes all i was trying to do is to get people to think a little bit more carefully about conceptualization and operationalization your article was the one assigned and anybody listening to this uh, this is why it's assigned right now uh so uh, so and and she looked at me and she had her eyes opened up like like she couldn't believe her ears like uh, me too. That's what I did today too. I, I talked about conceptual, <laughs> <laughs> and because she had she had this like very stereotypical view of quant person who doesn't think carefully about concepts and just thinks in terms of variables, which is what I used to be. And mm -hmm. I think it's a it's a very important goal for all researchers to to strive to become more than that. And your article is wonderful in uh, getting people to do this, and this is why I really love it. Um, Tell us what what's in the article. <laughs> What's in the article? So <laughs> the article has, I'd say, kind of three, three, four, right, core components. Um, so the first core component is really figure number one, um, where we're trying to visually uh, construct a shared framework uh, for scholars to talk about different conceptual, operational, um, and measurement uh, choices uh, that they're going to make. And I think one of the key things there is um, if you uh, you know, have the article in front of you. Um, and you look at the figure, it's the right hand side of the figure. And so usually we think about starting with a concept and operationalizing it and measuring it. Um, but we wanted to give as much attention to the movement back in the other direction, where your empirical knowledge um, about particular cases, if you're a qualitative scholar, about statistical patterns you might be seeing if you're a quantitative scholar, actually feeds back into revising um, your measurement choices or revising, revising your conceptual choices. Um, and so having both of those sides um, um, a figure one um, and just creating the figure. We spent so much time sitting, making that figure and arguing about what every little step in it should be called um, and so on. So I'd say that's one of the first uh, key um, conclusions. It, for, for what it's worth, anything I do, and I think I have the figure memorized at this point, but, but anything I do or anything anybody I talk to does, this figure comes out. <laughs> And, and I, I tell them, you need to think through this. And until you do, you're not moving forward. So, uh, so if, if, uh, if, if people don't take anything from this article, but figure one, uh, I think we've done our job already. So 
I, yeah, and, big fan. And then I'd say the second key uh, thing was the differentiation. If you look in that figure between what we called the background concept and, and the systematized concept, which was really about creating a basis to differentiate conceptual debates um, from measurement um, debates. So in the kind of background um, of that was the fact that we, I had also written with David Collier a piece um, on debates about uh, conceptualizing democracy and how do you justify different types of conceptual choices that you make. And so we were trying to articulate the relationship but also the distinction uh, between conceptual choices, conceptual debates and measurement choices um, and measurement debates. Um, and um, I like that distinction a lot. Uh, it's one of my favorite pieces um, of the article. So there's the figure, then there's, the, so there's the figure number one, there's the background uh, systematized distinction and how that allows us to differentiate conceptual debates uh, from measurement debates. And then there's two more, I think, main contributions. One is a long discussion of context and what does contextual specificity mean and what are its implications for measurement. And then the final really long section um, of the piece um, on trying to formulate an updated typology uh, for talking about forms um, of validation. So also the piece gets kind of step by step, I think a little bit more technical. Um, and I've always been intrigued by the fact that I end up being asked to review articles that make use of the final discussion about validation and different types of validation. Um, and I always thought the most interesting part of the article happens in the first 10 pages um, or so, but the part of it that perhaps has been more widely used in terms of um, my then getting pieces to review uh, are applications of that kind of validation typology um, at the end. It's interesting you say that because I, I actually think most of the value comes from from those first few pages, but that is because, um, so, you know, I studied at the University of Nebraska. It's not Stanford or Harvard. So it's not, not one of those places. For me to get a very good quantitative education, I had to go outside of my discipline. In fact, within political science, I, I, had, I had an intro to stats class and like three game theory classes. That's, that's all the quant education I had within political science. Everything else came, came from other places. Uh, psychology and education psychology were some of the most prominent places uh, where mm -hmm. I went. Uh, also sociology as well. But, uh, but that's where I went for my education. So I took classes on measurement, on, on uh, structural equation modeling, I mentioned already, in education psychology. And what's in the second half of the, the paper, which uh, you mentioned before we started the conversation, that it's, it was sort of almost like a literature review of mm -hmm. what's going out there. They taught that literature. <laughs> so for me, it was, oh, this is a nice literature review over here of, of what we know from psychology. Uh, but really the first half, so I fully agree with you as, as a person who comes from that field that... Uh, that uh, kind of the first 10 pages is great. I think it's important also to know that technical literature on, on, uh, on uh, validation and validity and et cetera. Uh, but uh, but um, you know, the reason I assigned this piece is, is because of the conceptualization. Mm -hmm. so, and yeah. I'd say kind of out of all of those pieces, the bit I feel like I'm most ambivalent about is the section on context and contextual specificity. Uh, I can't really decide if I think it's good, if I think it's kind of wishy-washy um, or whatever. So I know I love the kind of opening um, kind of sections. Um, the final sections, I think, are a little technical. I think they do what they do adequately. And then the contextual specificity section, I think, is the most... Um, I really, I mean, there's some things I really like about it and some things I really don't like about it. Um, in that <laughs> yeah, that, that, that makes sense. It, it's not a section that's jumping out at me when I think of this piece either. So, mm -hmm. so well, it's sense. also because we were writing a lot about context there, but we didn't engage at all in a kind of more interpretive understanding of what is context um, and what does it mean to think about context seriously um, and so on. So later in graduate school, when I was exposed uh, to interpretive methodological perspectives, I suddenly realized that we had been pretty superficial in our uh, conceptualization of what a context is um, in uh -huh. place. Um, and so, and that, 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 that section is where I could then kind of was like, oh, wow, that, that could have been done better. 
Huh, that's, that's interesting you bring that up because the next thing I were, where I wanted to go to is is uh, your views of uh, of how this piece stood up uh, uh, over time. Um, and I'm asking for because of two reasons. So so when I was really rereading it now, I noticed that especially early on, you very heavily build on King Cohen and Verba. And mm -hmm. uh, King Cohen and Verba is kind of falling out of favor in in the world and this this idea of we can we can we can bring together qualitative and quantitative research in in reasonable ways uh i think uh i think is is falling out of favor because uh, i think i think the crowd who says maybe we shouldn't uh, and and maybe we can't and maybe we shouldn't even try or or seem to be winning this debate right now uh also um so um um Fred Schaefer, uh, who is an interpretive vest, also teaches at the Method School uh, with us and, and is a good friend. So one, once I tried to rope him into to doing some uh, service for, uh, we were starting a journal and uh, needed some, I really wanted this journal to be pluralistic in, in its methodological approach and needed some interpretive vest to, 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 to pull into uh, to the editorial board. And uh, the section that we were responsible for was called methods and measurement. And, and he took an objection to just even the concept of measurement. Uh, and, and, and really, didn't, he, he asked me to change the, the, the section, section's name. And I was coming from the other side. I was thinking that we need to establish the section in, 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 in Frontiers of Political Science. We need to establish the section so we can finally have an outlet where people can think carefully about conceptualization and measurement and not get the review that you're not making a contribution because you're just conceptualizing it. So actually welcome these kinds of pieces in. And he took, he just completely objected to the whole idea. So, so I, I between these two things, between KKV and, and, and this, this little anecdote, uh, I feel like this view of the world might be going away. How, how, how do you, how do you feel about this? Oh, boy, that's a big question. That takes me back to a lot of the key developments when I was in graduate school um, mm -hmm. on um, as well. So I think one of the key things that you learn at some point in graduate school right, is that disciplines are made up of actual people uh, like us <laughs> uh, talking to one another. And some people are friendly um, and get along and other people are kind of competing um, with one another. And sometimes they're kind of forming coalitions um, and sometimes they're engaging in product differentiation, right? Um, and these kinds of dynamics are central to the way that kind of um, academic conversations develop. So. I remember the formation of the qualitative and multi-method section um, of the American Political Science Association. I was there um, at that uh, first meeting. And on the one hand, that was a coalition building where we're going to have multi-method research as well. But on the other hand, it's a product differentiation from the pre-existing methodology um, section. Um, but that was also part of the rise of multi-method research, which I think really sits in the backdrop um, of uh, the measurement validity article, um, is the same broader idea about qualitative and quantitative traditions have things to do together um, and so on. And that section embraced um, that idea. And then a few years later, I was present uh, when the interpretive uh, methodology section um, of the um, APSR or working group, I forget the exact institutional label for it, uh, also <laughs> formulated itself in a process of product differentiation from what the qualitative and multi-method folks um, had done. And it was only when I started being involved in conversations with those interpretive scholars that I realized that the shared standards we had articulated did not embrace uh, the whole extent um, of the discipline. Um, and there are some philosophical differences that cannot be bridged um, by even the most kind of accommodating of communication frameworks, right? Um, and so that uh, altered my attitude towards what I had done um, and introduced me to a bunch of scholars who I respect tremendously, who profoundly disagreed uh, with some of the assumptions <laughs> of this piece um, I had written. Um, and so I think that uh, trajectory has then accelerated uh, subsequently, um, the kind of differentiating one with the rise of experimental methods that criticize other forms of statistical methods. Um, and I just feel like there are 
there are cycles or trends in academic work and the kind of methodological fissuring um, of no, we're profoundly different from you um, or we're profoundly better than you um, and so on seems to be the generational kind of turn versus when I started graduate school, it was um, there, what was novel was to argue for the possibility um, of cooperating, doing multi-method work. And then what's novel um, at one point is by definition going to be the tired old, uh, what the previous generation was doing 20 years later. Uh, so it seems to my mind, in retrospect, inevitable uh, that the rise of a kind of multi-method perspective would be followed um, a generation later um, by the critiques um, of that perspective. And I expect things will turn around uh, mm -hmm. with another generation um, in turn. And that's just part of the sociology of academic fields over time. And the fact that every generation has to make its name by finding something to complain about, about what the previous generation did. <laughs> well, that was that was quite a meta answer. So, 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 what you actually think is that uh, that the next generation will come around and come back to uh, this this view of the world? I the well, so I am. Um, you know, I mean. Outside of my methodology side of things, um, I was actually, you know, trained as a historian of political thought and I worked on the history of political science and the history um, of the social sciences more broadly. And I think kind of generational um, dynamics um, uh, reflect in the way that the sociology fields perpetuate themselves over time, but through kind of uh, competition and differentiation um, and so on do produce like fairly almost predictable uh, to sound quite positivist. Uh, patterns um, of the cycling um, up and down of various kinds of approaches. So yeah, I, I would probably, if I was betting, I, I'd bet. But the forms of multi-method work might be different, right? It's like, how do you put together an interpretive um, reflection on meaning with an experiment or something like that, right? Yeah. So methods that are being combined might be different methods than the kind of standard, uh, I'll combine a regression with a couple of case studies, 1999 style uh, view of multi-method work. But I think the idea um, that there's space for creative collaboration um, is certainly one um, that has a lot of potential uh, to be Re revitalized oh I, I agree i agree but like i'm thinking of like who are the people who are like the staunchest critics of king Cohen and verba and 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 may by extension be a staunchest critics of of uh, of this work uh, i the one person that comes to mind is derek beach who who mm -hmm. is both of our good friends he's a process tracing scholar he's a co-convener of the method school a cpr method school with me so so he is he is a, a very strong opposition to to these uh, to these to these ideas. At the same time, uh, he's not against cooperation across fields. Mm -hmm. Like we're writing together right now, exactly, uh, not interpretivist, but but exactly we're writing about uh, how we can take uh, causal evidence from experience and augment that with uh, kind of the logic that process tracing uses in in establishing the mechanisms uh, underlying the the uh, experiment. So, so we're trying to write about this right now together, uh, trying to cooperate. So, so, so there's got to be some, some like. I think we have to differentiate just the meta of 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 right now we collaborate, then we differentiate, then we collaborate, and also the content. Do yeah. do you think do you think the content of this piece uh, stands up to what people want to see today? Uh, and, I think and, well, so. What this piece, or, or, or let yeah. me ask you differently. Uh, um, what would you write differently if you if you had to write it again, if anything? <laughs> So if I had to write differently, we I would probably talk about the kind of philosophical assumptions uh, more clearly. Mm -hmm. uh, um, so we don't articulate a, these shared standards are shared if you make certain philosophical assumptions um, in the first place. Uh, mm -hmm. so yeah. Within a certain kind um, of positivist uh, tradition. And then I might also differentiate um, between kind of agreeing to use the same language um, versus actually agreeing. Um, and so in that section on contextual specificity, 
we talk about questions about um, how context affects your measurement, but ultimately you could respond to that in two very different ways, right? Uh, mm -hmm. um, and so we might say that part of our goal was to create a language where people could talk about the same issue, but not to assume that they would then respond to it in the same way, right? Uh, mm -hmm. um, and so I think also kind of opening up um, that space uh, for articulating uh, disagreements within a common language um, is something that I think we were taking steps towards, but could have done more clearly. So the emphasis throughout is so much on the sharedness and the possibility mm -hmm. for sharedness um, that that fails to articulate philosophically who's outside the bounds um, of the assumptions of the conversation and then even within the conversation uh, what might be some different directions that people would go um, mm -hmm. and so that's th those parts of it were systematically underplayed it is a uh, coalition building um, article right um, in terms of the uh, sociology of who we were trying to bring together into conversation with one another, which means that we obscure potential differences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. So uh, any final thoughts on the article that uh, you want to share? Sure. So I actually think that conceptual work is one of the most productive and useful activities that graduate students um, can undertake. Uh, so I thought it might be useful, uh, since uh, we're talking uh, to graduate students uh, here today, uh, to flag the fact that if you look through the uh, citations um, at the end of this, uh, there's a piece from one uh, Stephen Levitsky uh, from 1998. And you might know Levitsky now as the tenured Harvard professor, the author of uh, How Democracies Die, who gets referenced um, in newspapers and so on. But once upon a time, he was a graduate student. Um, and one of the very first um, articles uh, he ever wrote was a very basic uh, conceptual piece um, on, uh, it was late 90s, and he was studying Argentina, and he was studying Peronism, um, and how the Peronist party had changed um, in the context of neoliberalism, and he found that it meant that the literature on party institutionalization didn't fit with his case, um, and he got a really basic, simple, one of his first articles out of that, right, um, and so I think for graduate students, looking carefully at the conceptual assumptions that are being handed down to you um, by the literature you're reading in your classes, comparing it to the empirical reality of what it is that you want to study, um, and then finding disconnections uh, between those and thinking about how to respond to that um, is something that you can do relatively easily, and it produces a certain type of uh, article um, type. Uh, that's an excellent type of work uh, for a graduate student to write as a conference paper, potentially as a first publication that helps them think about research design issues for their own dissertation research, uh, join a broader conversation um, and put the conceptual assumptions of previous scholars together with the empirical realities of the present moment um, in a way uh, that I think can be a great place uh, to kind of start um, an intellectual and academic uh, career. It actually reminds me of a conversation I just had with somebody recently. Uh, uh, I wish I knew who the person we were talking about was, but uh, but apparently this one person who's a political scientist, uh, I, I strongly suspect EUI graduate, European University Institute graduate, uh, uh, was asked what was the 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 most uh, most important contribution you had in your dissertation, and uh, and he answered that question by saying it was the introduction because I wrote a conceptual overview and and uh, and literature review of what I built on from that point on, and now it's published in the annual review of political science, <laughs> which is known to publish these kinds of works, and I was thinking that's really. Uh, 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 that's really a standard to strive to is to write such a good introduction that it's uh, that it's uh, that it becomes a contribution as a review piece uh, on your basic concepts and your background. Mm -hmm. So uh, so I, I I don't know who the article was, what the article was I don't know who the author was but but I really like that story. So so yeah so thank you. Yeah. I think we're thinking along the same lines.
Remember, and I think there's things. there's always room for more conceptual work because the world keeps changing and surprising us, shocking us, uh, giving us causes of despair. Um, and uh, we need to adapt our inherited um, academic languages uh, to learn how to talk um, about the most pressing problems um, of the current moment. Um, and that is essentially an invitation uh, to do uh, conceptual work as a starting point to then build uh, kind of rigorous empirical research um, upon. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Robert. This is great. Thank you very much for joining thank us. Thank you. And, it was a real uh, pleasure. Uh, good luck to all of you. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>